Praise the Lord. All right, so as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We thank you for your protection over your people. Thank you for bringing us here safe and sound. We're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight your word will enrich every life in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, that we'll be awake. Amen. We will not sleep. Amen. We will not dissolve. Amen. But your word will touch every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Make it a turning point in every life. Amen. And let your word do good in every life tonight. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. We're studying from John chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 14 all through to verse 27. John chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that shall come into the world. You find here that the people that have seen the miracles of Jesus Christ, they recognize who he was. Is a prophet to come. Look at verse 19. So when they had wrought about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing knives onto the ship, and they were afraid. Again, we read there one of the actions of Christ, one of the performances of Christ, one of the things that Jesus did that nobody had ever done. And because of that, that is because of the great work, those special works, and those miraculous works that he had done, there were people that were seeking him, they were looking for him, and eventually they found him. And when they found him, look at what he told them, verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him as God the Father sealed. As we're reading these chapters and studying the chapters, you'll see that every passage and every section I've been talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're talking about tonight, uh, Jesus Christ, the preeminent prophet and the coming king. Jesus Christ, the preeminent prophet and the coming king. Actually, as you look at Jesus, he's eternal. And because he's eternal, his attributes are infinite. That means you cannot finish learning and studying about Jesus Christ only in one study because he has infinite capacity and infinite attributes and infinite characteristics. As he is from everlasting to everlasting, that means from the deathless past to the deathless future. So his characteristics are innumerable. When we say innumerable, they are uncountable. That means they are without number. That means you cannot just come in and then in one single study, you finish everything you want to know or you want to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. As his personality is unlimited, so the study of his presentation in God's book, in God's word, is inexhaustible. I want to remind you of what we have learned already concerning the Lord Jesus Christ from chapter 1 until this beginning of chapter 6. We learned in chapter 1 is the eternal creator. Because without him was nothing made that was made. All things that are made were made by him. The eternal creator is being from the beginning even until now. And is going to continue until eternity. He had no beginning and he had no end. Not only that we learn. Number two is the light. The universal light. The one that comes to give light to everyone that dwells on the face of the earth. Number three is the glorious Lord. It says the word became flesh and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father and is full of grace and is of truth. Then it says, no man has ever seen the Father 
but the Son of God, the only begotten Son. That's another revelation about him. The only begotten Son, he has revealed him. The next day, John says, Jesus coming. And then he pointed at him. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He is the Lamb of God. That's the final sacrifice, the final atonement, the one that came to shed his blood so that you and I will be saved. But not only that, is the all-knowing and all-powerful king. Nathaniel said, we have found him. And now Nathaniel said, uh, how, can you, how can anything good come from Nazareth? And while he was coming, he said, an Israelite indeed. He said, how did you know me? And where did you see me before? He said, when you are under the tree and Philip called you, I saw you. And he said, thou art the king of Israel. Is the king that knows all things. Is the king that can do all things. Not only that, is a miracle walking Christ. Because he turned the water into wine and it will turn everything that needs to be turned in your life for better in Jesus name it's the omnipotent Lord because there are people that said we believe in him we believe in him and he would not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and he did not need that anybody will testify of man and then Nicodemus came in chapter 3 he said we know that thou art a teacher come from God because no man can do this miracles that thou doest except God be with him is the perfect teacher and he came to Samaria when he came to Samaria you know what the people said? They said, this is the savior of the world. And then you remember as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the son of man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we understand he is the only savior given by the father. And if you're going to be saved, and thank God you can be saved. I say, thank God you can be saved. The only name that brings salvation, and the only sacrifice that brings salvation, and the only Lord that brings salvation, that's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He came to report to John. He said, you know, the person you baptized and you pointed out at River Jordan is baptizing many more people than you are baptizing. He said, but I told you, he is the one that has the bride. He is the bridegroom. He must increase, and I more must decrease. Eventually you come to chapter 4. And he was talking to the woman by the well and this woman said, well, eventually with all that you are saying, I know that Messiah is coming and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said, I that speak unto thee, I am that Messiah, the expected Messiah. That's how that woman went out and then called everybody, come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. It's not this, the Christ. And they all came from the villages and cities of Samaria. And at the end, they said, now we know, not just because of your word, we've seen him. we heard heard him ourselves. And we know that this is the Savior of the world. And then you come to chapter 5. You remember the man that had been paralyzed and impotent for 38 years. And Jesus said, will thou be made home? And he said, how can I? Because I have no man. When the angel comes and troubles the water, there's nobody to pick me up and throw me in there. While I am coming, another steppeth in before me. And I've been losing my chance every time. And Jesus said, rise up. Take up your bed and go back home. He was healed immediately. He's here tonight. I said he's here tonight. He's the supernatural healer. In chapter 6, the beginning of chapter 6, is the all-sufficient provider. All those thousands of people, he fetched them. He will feed you. He'll take care of you. His compassion has not changed. His power has not changed. He's still the provider today, the all-sufficient provider. And today we're looking at him as a preeminent prophet. No other prophet like him. It's the final word. It's the final revelation of the Father. And God said, I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses. He will speak my word, and whatever you hear him say, obey him. And then is the powerful conqueror. Did I read it to you? He was walking on the sea. He 
conquers the power of Satan. He conquers the power of nature. He conquers the power of the flesh. He conquers the power of sin. In fact, he declared, all power in heaven and on earth is given unto me. And thank God we're serving a God that cannot fail. A God of all power. A God of all ability. And that God will walk in your life tonight in Jesus' name. And so as we look at Christ, we see him in all these various areas. The eternal creator is the light, is the glorious Lord. His only begotten son is the final lamb. Is the all-knowing, all-powerful king. Is the miracle-working Christ, is the omniscient Lord. He is the perfect teacher. He is the only savior. He is the bridegroom of the bride. He is the expected Messiah. He is the savior of the world. He is the supernatural healer. He is the final judge is the all-sufficient provider, is a preeminent prophet, he is a powerful king, and he wants to come and dwell inside your heart. And he wants to go home with you. And when you have this Christ, you'll never lack, you'll not be limited in your life in Jesus' name. I pray that this will be a glorious day in your life when more of Christ will come to you in Jesus' name. Once again, tonight, we're looking at Christ, the preeminent prophet, and the coming king. We're coming to chapter 6, reading from verse 14, all through to verse 27. The study tonight is divided to three parts. Number one, the recognition of Christ as that prophet. The recognition of Christ as that prophet. That's what they said. They said, this is the prophet. This is that prophet which was to come into the world. That is the recognition of Christ as that prophet. Point number two. The realization and the confirmation of his preeminence. Realization and the confirmation of his preeminence. Because we'll see him walking on the water. Greater than Moses. Greater than Joshua. Greater than Elijah. Greater than Elisha. Greater than David. Greater than Solomon. Greater than Jonah. Greater than all the prophets. Greater than all the angels. He is preeminent. And here we have the realization and the confirmation of his preeminence. Point number three. The recommendation and the caution for all people. His recommendation and his caution for all people. People. Point number one, the recognition of Christ as that prophet. We're coming to chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 14. Then those men which had seen the miracle that Jesus did said, This is of a truth, that prophet that shall come into the world. You see how they, how they spoke convincingly. Did you see how they spoke with finality? Did you see how they spoke without any compromise at all? Without any doubt in their mind? They said, this is of a truth. Without any shadow of doubt, this is of a truth. That prophet that shall come into the world. What did they mean by that? How did they say, this is the prophet that should come into the world? What did they mean? What were they referring to? They were referring to Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy now. Chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 15. They, had, they were looking at prophecy. They were looking at what the Almighty God himself had said. While the children of Israel were still in the wilderness before they got to the land of Canaan. Look at what the Lord had told them. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. That prophet is a small p or capital P. Tell me out loud capital P. You know the reason why anytime you read about the, pro the other prophets in the Old Testament like Elijah is a small P. It's an ordinary P. It's a normal P. Anytime you read about Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, and all those other prophets is a small P. But this one is a distinct, distinguished P. Is a prophet. Is a prophet like no other prophet. Is the very mouth of the Almighty God. Is the revelation of the Almighty God. Is the one that was still to come. That's why it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee and of thy brethren. Like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Unto him ye shall hearken. Moses said, When he comes, 
you forget about what I've told you. You listen to him. When he comes, you forget the old covenant. He's bringing a new covenant. When he comes, you forget all the things, all the rituals, all the ceremonies that have been introduced here because this is going to go on until he comes. When he comes, he's going to change everything. He will abolish the old. He will bring in the new. And unto him shall ye akin. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, I will raise them up. A prophet, tell me that kind of P again. Tell me out loud. Capital P, I will raise unto them a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. Whatever he says when he comes, that's the word of God. That's the final word of God. That's the full word of God. That's the transforming word of God. And that's the word of God, what you listen to. Because the Almighty said, when that prophet comes, I'll put my very word in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Underline that word all. Underline that word. It says, when he comes, I'm going to give him the fullness of revelation. The entirety of revelation, the completeness of revelation is going to give you the mind of God. Everything God intends to teach, everything God intends to transfer to you. Look at verse 19, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hack in unto my words, the word of God, the eternal word. The word of God, the powerful word, the word of God, the transforming word, the word of God, the word that has resurrection and life in it. Whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. You can see then that the Old Testament had been looking forward to that time when he will come. The Christ, the final word, and the final revelation of the Father. Come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, and see the fulfillment of that. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, we're looking at verse 22. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things. In how many things? Him shall ye hear, tell me out loud. In all things, when he talks about repentance, you listen to him. When he talks about redemption, you listen to him. When he talks about regeneration, transformation, salvation, righteousness, you listen to him. When he talks about sanctify them through thy truth, that word is truth, you listen to him. When he talks to you and he says, only the pure in heart shall see God, you listen to him. When he talks to you about any subject, about heaven, about hell, you listen to him because he says, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Look at verse 20. Three and it shall come to pass that every soul, every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. That's very serious. He says, The people that will say, No, I don't want Christ, I don't want Jesus, I don't want the Savior, I don't want to listen to this final revelation. He says, They'll be destroyed from among the people. Yea, verse 24, and all the prophets from Samuel. And those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets in the plural, and of the covenant which God made with the fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Look at verse 26, unto you first. Unto you Jews as false, because he's still going to minister to Gentiles. Unto you false God, having raised up his son, give me his name. Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. You'll see then that the prophecy concerning the prophet that is to come, it concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the people were saying in John chapter 6. They said, this is of a truth, the prophet that shall come into the world. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7 verse 37. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 37. 
Acts chapter 7, verse 37, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Do you see the repetition in the New Testament? Because they knew that Jesus Christ was a prophet to come. The special prophet and the specific prophet and the one that is highly exalted above all other prophets. It says like unto me, him shall ye hear. We we'll see that every time it says him shall ye hear. We're coming to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 40 and verse 41. The Lord Jesus Christ revealed unto us as the final voice of the Father. The final revelation from the Father and the final word that the Father has to speak to humanity. John chapter 7, reading from verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, tell me, of a truth, tell me, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? So you will see many of the people as they heard him. Many of the people as they saw the work that he did. As they saw the miracles that he performed. They confirmed, they said, this is the prophet. This is the Christ. We're coming back to John chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 15. John chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him, how would they take him? By force to make him what? A king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Listen to this one. Because it says now, it's talking about Jesus Christ. They said of the truth, this is the prophet, the prophet that was to come. And now it says they had a kind of consultation, a kind of conspiracy, a kind of communal discussion together. And they say, we must make him the king immediately. And they were going to force him to become their king. And we're told that Jesus, when he saw that they were going to force him to be a king, then he departed. He left them. The question is, was Jesus a king? Was he supposed to be a king? If he was supposed to be a king, why then did he leave them and departed and like or use the word and ran away from his being forced to become a king? And let's establish the fact that he was to be a king. We're looking at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 2. Matthew chapter 2, tell me the verses. One and two. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born? Tell me, king of the Jews. Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and I come to worship him. These uh, wise men, uh, the Magi's, they came uh, from the east. And they came and they were asking, what is he that is born? King uh, of the Jews. Where did they get that idea that Jesus Christ was to be king? They got it. Look at Psalm 2. And we're reading from verse 6. Psalm 2. We're reading from verse 6. You will understand then that Jesus Christ, yes, the prophet. Yes, that prophet. Yes, that unique, special prophet that was to come into the world. But also the king. We're looking at Psalm 2. And I'm reading from verse I'm reading from verse 6. It says, Yet have I set my, tell me, king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. Can you make the connection? is the son of God, the only begotten of the father. And yet God said, I set him as my king upon my holy hill, Zion. And he said, I will declare the decree. 
the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, ask of me. And I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Jesus is king. You believe that? Give me a good amen. amen. But then as we're talking about Jesus Christ as king, uh, we were coming to Revelation, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17 uh, and we're reading from verse 14. Revelation chapter 17, reading from verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? The Lamb shall overcome them. Who is the Lamb that shall overcome them? It's Jesus. For he is, tell me, Lord of lords, and tell me what follows. Is king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So you understand that he's supposed to be king. He will be king. And then we're coming to chapter 19 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. Look at verse 16 now. And he has on his vesture. And on his tie, a name reaching. Tell me the name. Tell me out loud. Tell me if you are happy that he is king of kings. A name reaching is king of kings and lord of lords. And so we understand that is that prophet, the prophet that should come. And then is the king, king of kings and lord of lords. We're coming back to John. And we're looking at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I'm going to read those two verses together. We're looking at verse 14 and verse 15. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did said, this is of a truth, that prophet that shall come into the world. Look at verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king he departed again into the mountain himself alone the question is why did he leave them forsake them run away from them and will not allow them to make him a king actually the prophecy of the word of God concerning Jesus Christ tells us he'll be number one, prophet, number two, priest, number three, king, in that order. Number one, he'll be prophet, that he shall come, he will teach, he will speak, he will declare, He'll proclaim the might of God. He will show people how to get into the kingdom of God. He'll talk about repentance. He'll talk about trusting God. He'll talk about faith. He'll talk about water baptism. He'll talk about the life we ought to live. He'll talk about how to get ready for the rapture. He'll talk about how to get to heaven. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He'll talk, number one, as the prophet of God declaring the mind of God. Number two, he will then be our priest. The priest that will make sacrifice. The priest that will make atonement. The priest that will offer the lamb. The, the priest that will shed the blood of atonement so that the people that need to get into the kingdom will be cleansed, will be washed, will be converted, will be made ready for the kingdom. After being prophet and priest, then 
he will be king. But you see, these people they didn't understand. Therefore, they saw that this is the prophet, and they wanted to meet that office of the priest, and eventually, immediately make him a king, but a king over natural people, a king over sinful people, a king over unconverted people, a king over unredeemed, unregenerated people. But that was not the aim. That was not the goal. That's why he said, and look at John chapter 18. John chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 36. John chapter 18. Verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. It's going to be a king. It's not going to rule over earthly people, worldly people, sinful people, unregenerated people, and the people that are defiled. It's not going to rule over rebellious Israel. It's going to first of all make a sacrifice. It's going to be the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It's going to get them saved. It's going to get them transformed. It's going to get them converted and changed. And in those redeemed people, he will now be king over those those regenerated people, cleansed people, converted people, and the people that are ready for the kingdom of heaven. That's why he said in verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Are thou a king then? Are thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this purpose was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should be a witness unto the truth. That's my first assignment, be a witness unto the truth. The truth of God. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth, and the Son of God, who is the personification of the truth, will set you free. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice voice. And I pray that you'll hear that voice even tonight in Jesus' name. Uh, but let, let's see. Let's see the office of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, the prophet. Number two, the priest. And number three, the king. We're coming back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. And I'm reading from verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Verse, verse what? Verse 15, it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee, will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee and of thy brethren. Like unto me, unto him shall ye hearken. As the prophet, it was a final word. As the prophet, it was a final revelation from God the Father. As the prophet, it was a perfect, full, preeminent, final truth of total redemption. That's the number one office. And they recognize that number one office. But we're not waiting for the second office. His second office was that of the priest. We're coming to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, and we're reading from verse 3. You see, after he taught the truth, the people, the natural people, the sinful people, and the Israelitish people, and the Gentile people, there's no way they'll be able to obey the truth of the word of God. Be ye perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. There's no way the natural man who has not tasted the ministry of the priest, there's no way he can fulfill that. Nobody in his natural strength, natural power, and natural life can fulfill the word of God. And so he has revealed the might of God. As the prophet, he must now reveal the atonement. He must not reveal and must not put in place the very fact that he would sacrifice himself as the priest to offer the lamb uh, that will save the whole world. Isaiah chapter 53, I'm reading from verse 3. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he, and he will heed as it were our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not surely. 
he has borne our griefs. That's the priest now. And he has uh, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but was wounded for our transgression. It is not the prophet, now this is the priest. This is the one that made atonement for our sin, and was bruised for iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his tribes, tell me, were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned uh, every one uh, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him uh, the iniquity of us all. You see, when the prophet came as a prophet, he said, these are the things that defile me. These are the things that condemn me. These are the things that will make us unacceptable in the sight of God. And it's what gave us guilt and condemnation. And then we say, what shall we do to be saved? And this is now the office of the priest. He comes as a prophet. He reveals the mind of God to us. He gives us the nature of God, the requirement of God, the commandment of God. And we see that we cannot measure up. And then he says, but you need to get to my second office. And that's the office of the priest. And that brings salvation. That's why it says he was oppressed. He was afflicted. And yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, that's the sacrifice, and as a sheep before, her shearers is dumb, and so he openeth not his mouth. Verse 10, yet he pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grieve. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his son. Give me a good amen. amen. And so you understand, he will make the sacrifice. They didn't wait for him to make that sacrifice. They didn't wait for him to shed the blood of that Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. They wanted to jump from being a priest unto being a king. That's why the Lord said, no, not yet, not yet. There must be the atonement. There must be the cleansing. There must be transformation of life. There must be the change. First, the prophet, then the priest. Tell me what to follow. The king. We're coming to Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Deuteronomy came before Isaiah. Isaiah came before uh, Daniel. In Deuteronomy, that's the prophet. In Isaiah, he shows us the priest. And now in Daniel, he shows us the king. We're coming to Daniel chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 13. I saw in the night visions, behold, one like, like who? Like the Son of Man. He came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they, and they brought him near unto him. Look at this now. And there was given him, who is that him? The Son of Man. I said, who is that him? Son of man. Who is the son of man? Jesus Christ. He came to the ancient of days. He's going to receive now all power. He's going to receive all authority. He's going to receive the rod and the scepter of the king. It says, and there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And all people, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's his position as the king. You understand? He was to be prophet, number one, number two, priest, number three, king. And he wanted to jump over. He wanted to cancel that area and that ministry of the priest so that uh, they remain in their sins. And then they wanted to force Jesus Christ to be a king over and to reign over unregenerated and sinful humanity. But he says, no, they'll be redeemed. They'll be cleansed. They'll be washed. They'll be born again. And then he'll reign over the redeemed, converted humanity. We'll come to point number two now. That's the realization and confirmation of his preeminence. We're coming to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We're reading from verse 16. In John chapter 6, verse 16, it says, And when the evening was now come, 
his disciples went down unto the sea, and he entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. You know, he had departed alone by himself, and he had gone to the mountain. He had gone alone to pray. And it says the disciples were now all alone, and the sea arose, in verse 18, the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea. They see Jesus, tell me, tell me out loud. They see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing knives unto the sheep, and they were afraid. And he says unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Tonight it is he. Be not afraid. Amen. Whatever is happening in your life, be not afraid. Amen. Because Jesus Christ, the mighty one, Jesus Christ, the preeminent one, he will walk mightily in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. When, this, when it says, and they were afraid, the question is, why were they afraid? They've never seen anybody doing that before. Anybody walking on water before. They've seen Moses dividing the sea so that the people will walk on the ground. On the ground. Well, you have the heap of water there, the heap of water there. And they have heard, they have read about Joshua dividing River Jordan. While the River Jordan parted and then they can go on dry ground. They have heard about Elijah dividing Jordan, but they have to go on dry ground. But for somebody not to divide the river, water. And for somebody to just step on it and walk on it like concrete they'd never seen that before that's his greatness that's his power that's his might that's his majesty that's the very fact that he does what no other person has ever done and then he goes on after he told them be not afraid now he tells them look at verse 21 then they willingly received him into the ship and immediately the sheep was at the land whither they went. You understand that? That is, once he stepped into that boat, the storm came to an end, and immediately they didn't even know they got to the shore immediately. They had never seen that before. And that tells us then they had no excuse. All those Jewish people. All those people that saw the miracles of Christ, they had no excuse. You know why? Because Jesus did what no other man had ever done. Because Jesus taught what no other man had ever taught. Because Jesus performed miracles that no other person had ever performed. Because Jesus knew and Jesus revealed the truth and the knowledge that no other minister, no other prophet had ever revealed. Because Jesus Christ taught what no other teacher had ever done. What no other founder of religion had ever said, Jesus said, Jesus did. Jesus performed. They had no excuse for their unbelief and rejection. Those Jewish people who heard Jesus, those Jewish people who saw Jesus, those Jewish people who saw the miracles that Jesus did like no other person ever did. They had overwhelming evidence that this is the very Christ, that this is the Messiah. But it closed their eyes to overwhelming evidence. They resisted the irresistible. They persisted in darkness and they deliberately and firmly shut their eyes to the light. They were lost. They intentionally chose to go to hell and they knowingly refused to get to heaven. As we're studying all this about Jesus Christ, and you understand, it's incomparable. You cannot compare him with any other personality you have ever heard of. If you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's your choice. And that's your, uh, that, that's your choice after you've got the overwhelming evidence that Jesus Christ is like no other man, no other prophet, like no other Messiah, like no other Savior, like no other one, because he's the only one that can save you. And then uh, if you do not accept him as your personal Savior, that's your deliberate choice, but it's going to be a choice that will lead to hellfire. I pray that today you'll choose right. Somebody there said, you'll choose right. 
you will be saved. If you are saved already, you'll stay saved. You receive the grace of God, you'll be holy, and you'll be ready. Hey, look at what Jesus did. Look at the record of other scriptures in Matthew. Matthew chapter 14, he walked on the sea. Any trouble see your life, he'll walk on that thing. And when it comes on that troubled sea of your life, it will come to a calm and there will be peace in your life, in your family, in your ministry in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 23. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. When he had sent the multitude away, he went into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was calm, he was there alone. And the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them. Tell me. Jesus went to them, say it with confidence. There's nothing for you to fear. There's no trouble for you to fear. No persecution for you to fear. Because Jesus is going to walk on the stormy sea of your life in Jesus' name. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. And straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Saying, tell me, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, and he said, come. I wanted to hear you well. And he said, come. come. Just one, one word. Just one word. And that one word brought power. That one word brought the impossible. That one word brought the incredible. He speaks one word to you today. And you are well. Yeah. He speaks one word and your life is changed. Yeah. It speaks one word and what you have never done in your life and what no relative of yours has ever done. Just one word from Jesus Christ. You will do it in Jesus' name. He will empower you. He will transform your life. He will make you like himself. Did you see how the amen is dying down? And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. The Lord will save you. The Lord will deliver you. Immediately, immediately, it will not be slow. It will not delay the answer to your prayer. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him O thou of little faith wherefore didst thou doubt and when they Jesus and Peter and when they Jesus and you and when they I said Jesus and you and when they Jesus and the believer when they were coming to the ship the wind ceased looks like tonight that wind in your life is coming to an end the wind ceased. It will cease. Once Jesus gets into your boat, all the troubles are over. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, thou art the son of God. Of a truth, thou art the son of God. And he wants to reign in your life. He wants to rule in your family. He wants to cancel every storm and every wave out of your family tonight in Jesus' name. Look at Mark, Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 35. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And the same day, when the evening was come, he says unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And he's saying unto you, let us pass over unto the other side. We have spent too long time in weakness. Let's pass over to the side of strength. We have spent too long time in confusion. Let's pass over to the side of calmness. We have spent too much time in the area of storm and trouble and crying and weeping. Tonight, let us pass over. Somebody, I said, let us pass over. 
with Jesus Christ inviting us and he says there's another side it's a brighter side it's a wonderful side it's the side of miracle it's the side of power it's the side of manifestation and it's the side of the performance of the work and the wonders of God let us pass over on to the other side I'm passing over or are you there I said I'm passing over nothing will tie you down and nothing will disturb your life in Jesus' name. He says, let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, verse 36, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him all the little ships. And there arose, and there arose, and there arose a great storm of wind, and waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And uh, he was in the hinder part of the ship sheep asleep on a pillow and they awake him and they say unto him master carest not thou that will perish how can you perish with Jesus in the boat how can you perish with Jesus in your heart how can you perish with Jesus in your family he cares he cares and he loves you you will not perish you will not be drowned it says in verse 39, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. There will be peace in your soul. Peace in your family. And peace in your community. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said unto one another, What manner of man is this? What manner of teacher is this? What manner of prophet is this? What manner of savior is this? What manner of deliverer is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. He has power tonight to roll all those problems away. And he will. I said he will. He showed overwhelming evidence to those people that he is the very son of God and he is the savior. He is the prophet that should come into the world and he is that a priest and he is a king of kings and lord of laws. And he has given us overwhelming evidence tonight that he can solve every problem in our lives. He can move every mountain in our lives. And as we trust him tonight, he will bring you to the victory, glory land in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now. His recommendation and caution for all people. His recommendation and caution for all people. We're coming to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 22 the following day. When the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that is except that one wherein to his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nice unto the place where they did each bread after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. Seeking, tell me. Seeking for. Seeking for. It's wonderful to seek for Jesus. But you know, must have the right attitude. Must seek for the right reason. Go on to verse 25. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Listen to this. You seek me. You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled, labor not for that meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him as God the Father sealed. You see what Jesus is telling us here? 
is telling us that not all religious activities are profitable. Seeking after the Lord, seeking after the Lord. The motive is very important. The reason is very important. And the purpose is very important. Not all religious pursuit is profitable. Not all religious zeal is profitable. Not all religious earnestness. The people are very earnest. They're very earnest in religion. We're seeking for Jesus. We're seeking for Jesus. We're going far. We're looking for Jesus. We're going to a camp. We're looking for Jesus. We're going for retreat. We're looking for Jesus. We're going to a convention. We're looking for Jesus. We're going to a camp meeting. We're looking for Jesus. They're earnest about it. They're passionate about it. And the Lord Jesus is saying, it's not all passion like that that is profitable. It's not all zeal like that that is profitable. And it's not all earnestness like that that is profitable. It's not all activity, religious activity. We're active here. We're active here. We're active here. The purpose is very important. The reason is very important and the motive is very important. That's why I was telling them, you know why you're seeking me? You're not seeking me for the right reason. It's not even all prayer that is uh, profitable. We're praying and we're praying and we're praying. And we're praying for only the things we can see and touch, the things that are tangible. We're not praying for life eternal. We're not praying to get to heaven. We're not praying to get real Christian experiences. We're not praying to be holy. We're not praying to be righteous. We're not praying to be rapturable. And we're only praying for mundane things of this world. It is not all the prayers that are profitable. And it's not labor that is profitable. Because Jesus said, you are laboring, yes, I know. And you are endeavoring, yes, I know. You are enthusiastic, yes, I know. You are excited, yes, I know. But you are laboring for the meat that perisheth. You are laboring for the things of the present day. And you are not laboring for the things of life to come, eternal life. And and so he said, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him as God the Father sealed, laboring for the right thing. And let's look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, I'm reading from verse 2. Isaiah chapter 58. We're reading here from verse 2. It says in verse 2, Yet they seek me daily, and they like to know my ways, as a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They delight to take the light in approaching to God. When it says yet, what did you use the word yet? It says yet, they seek me daily. Come back to verse 1, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. They were full of sin. They were full of transgression. They did not repent. They did not give their lives to the Lord. They did not serve the Lord in holiness and righteousness. Yet, they seek me daily. What are they seeking the Lord for? I need a job. I need employment. I need certificate. I want success. I want food. I want to get married. I want children. I want to get lunch. I want to build a house. Such and such is riding a car. I want to ride a car. That's why they are praying. That's why they are seeking the Lord. That's why the Lord said, they did not repent from their sins. They did not turn away from their sins. Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily. Yet they delight to know my ways. Yet they look like a nation that did righteousness. Yet they forsook not the ordinance of their God. Yet they ask of me the ordinances of justice. Yet they take the light in approaching to God. But it was still sinful. The Lord doesn't want any seeking like that. We're looking at Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 45, Jeremiah chapter 45, and we're reading from verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Here's another group of people seeking great things for themselves. For themselves, They're not seeking for the glory of God. They're not seeking for the honor of the Lord. They're not seeking for the establishment of the kingdom of God. They're not seeking that righteousness will prevail, that holiness will be in their lives and be in their families. All they're seeking for, they're seeking for great things for themselves. Church people might be like that, you know. 
no repentance, no righteousness, no holiness, no seeking for heaven, no seeking for things of eternal value, but they're seeking great name and great position and great authority and great recognition. Seek it thou great things for thyself, seek them not. Seek them not. Matthew chapter 6, we're reading from verse 31. Matthew chapter 6. We're reading from verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what withal shall we be clothed? As you look at the prayers of people and analyze their prayers, that's all they want. Um, you know, I'm studying now so I can pass my exams. That's good. Then so I can uh, succeed. That's good. So I can have a job. That's good. So I can have a house shelter. That's good. So I can buy clothes. That's good. So I can eat. That's good. So I can get married. That's good. And there's nothing spiritual. Everything is about what we get here on the side of the grave. And the Lord is saying, take no thought. Don't put all your mind all your energy, all your pursuit, all your seeking, all your prayer on that. For after all these things do the gentle seek. It says, if that's all your prayer, analyze your prayer. I want this, I want this, I want that. But there's no salvation in your request. There's no holiness in your request. There's no heaven in your request. It says, that's how the people came and they said, Jesus, when did you come here? We'll be seeking for you, looking for you, and said you are seeking me because you have eaten of the loaves on your field. Labor not for the things that perish, but labor for things of life eternal. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 21. Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 21. It's telling us what we should not seek and how we should not seek. Philippians chapter 2. What verse are you looking for there? Verse 21. It says in verse 21, For all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ's. All seek their own. They're seeking for what they are going to put on earth here. When Christ comes, they will not be able to take them away. They're seeking for what they can build here, establish here, found here, whatever. And the Christ, when Christ comes, they'll not be able to take away. They're not seeking for the kingdom of God. They're not seeking for the expansion of the kingdom of God. They're only seeking for what satisfies them. And here the word of God says, for all seek their own and not the things that are Jesus Christ. We're coming back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 27. John chapter 6, verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but labor for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him God the Father sealed. It tells us that we shall seek the Lord and seek things that are eternal. What does that mean? How does that translate into my life and into your life? We're looking at Osea chapter 10. Osea chapter 10, what he wants us to seek. What we must seek and what we must make number one, the priority in our pursuit, in our prayer, in our earnestness, in our zeal, in our running after the Lord and seeking for Jesus, what should be number one? We're looking at uh, Osea chapter 10 verse 12. Osea chapter 10. Osea chapter 10 verse 12. So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till they come and reign, tell me, righteousness upon you. That should be number one. That should be number one. What takes you to heaven? What brings the presence of God in your life? And what links you up to God? Relationship with God. It says you break up your fallow ground. Sometimes the heart is dull. And the heart is hard. And the heart does not have any feeling at all. And we hear the word of God. And it appears it doesn't move us. It says, no, you tell your heart. You must receive the word. And break up your fallow ground. And pray and seek the Lord. Until he comes and he rains righteousness upon you. He'll do it today. Yeah. We're looking at Zephaniah chapter 2. Zephaniah is uh, getting near the uh, end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah, just keep on opening from that uh, area, from that uh, Osea, and you keep on and on and on. Zephaniah chapter 2. Zephaniah chapter 2. 
Are you there now? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, say wonderful, everybody. Wonderful. Yes, you are wonderful. We're looking in at Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Okay, if you are there, tell me the first words there. Wonderful. Seek ye the Lord, or ye meek of the earth. He said, We should seek the Lord, which has wrought his judgment. Seek, what are you seeking here? Righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. There's time of wrath coming. There's a time of judgment coming. And it says, seek the righteousness of the Lord. Seek the meekness from the Lord. And make sure you have salvation. Make sure you have his forgiveness and righteousness. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What are we to seek first? I said, what are we to seek first? <laughs> Marriage? No. Children? No. Healing? No. Deliverance? No. Prosperity? No. Land? No. Houses? No. Certificate? No. What should be number one in our lives? No. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. But seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, praise the Lord, shall be added unto you. I thought uh, uh, Solo would say amen. We're coming to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. Set your affection, your desire, your pursuit, your zeal, your earnestness. It says set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is sealed with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Ye shall appear with him in glory. That's when we're seeking the right thing. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're looking at verse 14. For they that uh, say such things declare that they seek a country. They seek a country. We're seeking the heavenly country. Because if, of, if uh, in this world only we have the things of the world and we don't have salvation, we'll be of all men the most miserable. But then we declare heaven is important for us. Salvation is important for us. Holiness, sanctification are important for us. Holy Ghost baptism is the power that makes us to be effective witnesses unto the Lord. Very important for us. Therefore, they that seek such things declare plainly that they seek a country truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had opportunity to have returned but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city I pray you'll be there chapter 12 chapter 12 of Hebrews verse 14 follow peace with how many people Follow peace with how many people? Amen. All men in your yard, all men in your community, all men in your school, all men in your college, all men at your university, all men in your office, all men in your village, all men wherever you are living. It says follow peace with all men. Christians don't fight. Believers don't fight. Pilgrims towards heaven, they don't fight. Follow peace with all men in your church and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You will not sell your salvation. You will not sell your birthright. And this ticket to heaven, you will not lose it. You will not sell it in Jesus' name. In verse 17, for we know, for we know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it, the seeking, past tense of seek, though he sought it carefully with tears. At this time, when the door is open, you'll see the righteousness of God in Jesus' name. 
chapter 13 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, we're reading from verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him uh, without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city. Tell me what follows. Tell me out loud. But we we'll seek one to come. We're we'll seeking to get to heaven. I pray you'll be there. I said I pray you'll be there. Nothing will stop you from heaven in Jesus' name. Second Peter, Second Peter, chapter three, Second Peter, chapter three, verse ten. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and all the works that are therein shall be burnt up. You know, all that the people are seeking today, they're running the rat race, I want this, I want this, I want that. When Christ comes and the Antichrist takes over in this world, they will lose all those things. Everything will be burnt in fire. But only the people that seek salvation and get salvation, they seek righteousness, they have righteousness, they seek the kingdom of God, they have the kingdom of God, and they are, they are rapturable. Only those people will know that what they sought on earth was profitable. That's why it says in verse 11, seeing them that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of business ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, I'm one of them, we, I said I'm one of them, nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, where dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent, that she may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. You'll have salvation, and you'll keep that salvation. You'll have righteousness, holiness, sanctification. You'll keep it in Jesus' name. And the Lord will make you ready and rapturable in Jesus' name. Don't just seek the things of this world. Seek life eternal, the things that will take you to heaven. Let's be wise today. And let us pray that God will help us to put first things first and then all the other things. But the Lord, at his own time, he will add them unto us in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. We've heard so much today. We've listened to what the Lord had to teach us, had to reveal to us. Now we want to seek the face of the Lord. Let this uh, preeminent uh, Christ, preeminent prophet and the coming king, uh, let him bring life eternal unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. After that, all these things shall be added unto you. All these things shall be added unto you. Open your mouth and pray. Talk to the Lord. The Lord wants to give salvation, wants to give holiness, wants to give sanctification, and he wants to give you blessings untold. <laughs>